Whoever wrote Psalm 116 understands suffering. He's gotten the short end of the stick. He knows what it's like to get the pink slip instead of the job promotion. She knows what it's like to hear, I think we need to take a break. It's not you, it's me. Instead of the exciting proposal, will you marry me? He knows what it's like to get the doctor's report that the cancer is spreading instead of the cancer is in remission. This psalmist knows what it's like to suffer. And we don't know exactly what trials he has endured, but we know that the original text says, The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me, and I suffered distress and anguish. But while this psalm begins with lament, it quickly turns to a vivid, heartfelt song of praise and gratitude, doesn't it? Biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann speaks of Psalm 116 as a psalm of new orientation. He says the psalmist found himself in the pit of disorientation. That is, his life was flipped upside down. Everything came crashing down around him. You might know what this feels like. But somehow, he has gotten through that pit of disorientation, and he has been able to reorient himself. That is, he has pivoted from suffering to celebration. God, you raised me up to new life, he says. You dry my tears and guide my feet. And then, he asks the question that reveals he is a person of more than just a fleeting faith. What shall I give back to you, O God, for all your goodness to me? You see, he knows that God is somehow a part of all of this, that he did not get himself out of this mess on his own, but that God worked in some way to show him a path forward. Maybe it was through another person. Maybe it was through an insight in a dream. Maybe it was through a flat-out miracle. But however it happened, a path emerged. And he believes that the force that bushwhacked its way through the weeds of pain and suffering in his life to pave that path of new life was God. Two of the ways that the psalmist answers today's question hold teachable moments for us. He expresses gratitude and he bears witness. I will offer to you the gift of gratitude, O God, and I will bear witness to you, O giver of life. I will invite others to awaken to the joy of your presence. You see, the psalmist chooses to stand in the midst of his community and he boldly declares what God has done in his life. Gratitude is not restricted just to his private nightly prayers or his own gratitude journal, but rather he says, thank you, God, and celebrates that with the community. He's just one guy, but he has a powerful testimony. And Lord knows when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, it is so very crucial, isn't it, for us to hear the stories of others who have come through distress and overcome it, endured, and survived. I believe that God can be found in all places, in all people, and in all circumstances. To be clear, that does not mean that God brings great blessing and joy to some while inflicting great pain and suffering on others. There's a complexity to life that I don't think any of us will understand this side of heaven. I don't have an answer for the question of why some people suffer while others seem to soar. And neither does the psalmist. Instead, though, Instead of trying to seek an answer to that question, 
the psalmist shows us how to seek an attitude that when practiced regularly, lessens our need for absolute answers. And that attitude is gratitude. Today, I want to invite us to focus on three kinds of gratitude. The first I'm calling obvious gratitude. This is gratitude for those people and places that bring us joy that we don't even have to think about. When someone says, what are you grateful for? Already you rattle off my parents, my grandparents, my children, my grandchildren, my dog, the dinner food on the table, you know, all of those things that just pop to your mind. Obvious, right? Obvious gratitudes. The second kind of gratitude I'm calling awakened gratitude because it's for the things that are all around us but we have to wake ourselves up to their presence. This is gratitude for those people and things, places and situations that most of us, to be honest, take for granted every day. Things like running water and shelter, healthcare, education, air conditioning in the summer, heat in the winter, clothes that fit, TV shows that entertain us, books that challenge us, A sky that pours forth sleety snow one day and warm yellow sun rays the next. Gratitude for each each inhale we breathe and each exhale we let go. Gratitude for the person who holds the elevator for us, for the gasoline in our car, for the fact that maybe we got out of bed this morning and we're not walking with a limp. These are those things that are not hard to be aware of but we have to be aware of them. We have to awaken to them. The third kind of gratitude I'm calling hindsight gratitude. And it's the kind of gratitude that the psalmist is mirroring for us in Psalm 116. Gratitude to God that comes through looking back on our lives and seeing where God was at work in the times when we were wondering whether God even existed at all. Gratitude for the gifts that emerge even within the most painful circumstances. Gratitude that comes once we are through the suffering and we're on the other side and we can look back and see those people who are the light of Christ to us. Or we can be introspective and realize that yes, our faith is stronger because we went through X, Y, or Z. Or maybe our hope is more resilient because we lost the very person who is most dear to us or the dream that was most real to us. They say hindsight is 2020. So this is gratitude that comes into view slowly as time passes and wounds heal. Now most of us are well practiced at that first kind of gratitude, the obvious gratitude. You probably just had a time of sharing in your Sunday school class and you might have even practiced obvious gratitude there. We say thank you for our friends and family and food all the time. Less of us practice daily the second kind of gratitude, which is called awakened gratitude, because it requires a bit more attention and focus. Waking up to all that is alive around us is not hard, but it does mean we have to slow down and be intentional and thoughtful. Our lives are so busy and crammed with places to be and people to see that sometimes we don't even look into the eyes of the person who's right next to us. Or our lives have fallen into such a routine that we forget that pushing the button on the coffee pot in the morning and having hot black caffeinated liquid pour out is no small miracle. That is awakened gratitude. But even fewer of us take the time to work at the third kind, hindsight gratitude. Saying thank you for the hard times in life. This is gratitude for the circumstances and experiences that you would never wish on anyone else, but that have made you stronger and more compassionate for having gone through them yourself. And the scars that we have from those experiences become the stars that guide our path.
thanks to Robert Schuller for that beautiful scars to stars. Hindsight gratitude is the kind of gratitude that our faith requires. A gratitude that comes when we acknowledge that God is with us in all circumstances, that God dwells within the heart of everything. Again, it doesn't mean that God causes a bad experience to happen or wants us to suffer. It means that while we are suffering, God is there to show us hope, to teach us something new. And the more we practice it, the more we can do it in real time, in the midst of our suffering, and not just in hindsight. On December 18th, 2009, in the heart of the economic recession, British rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote a beautiful prayer-filled reflection on gratitude. And I think it speaks to all three kinds of gratitude, obvious, awakened, and hindsight. I'm going to read a few excerpts for you. As the new year approaches, with the recession still in full force, I find myself giving thanks to God for all the things that cost nothing and are worth everything. I thank God for the blessing of grandchildren. I don't know why I was so surprised by the joy, but in their company, my constant thought is that I didn't know life could be this good. I thank God for the friends who stood by us in tough times, for the mentors who believed in me more than I believed in myself, and for the teachers who encouraged me to think and question. I thank God for those rare souls who lift us when we are laid low. I thank God for the fragments of light that he has scattered in so many lives, in the kindness of strangers, and the unexpected connecting of souls across the boundaries that once divided them. I thank God for the gift of being born a Jew, despite all the persecutions visited on our people often in the name of the same God my ancestors worshipped. I thank God for the transformation of the relationship between Jews and Christians that has happened in my lifetime. I thank God for Beethoven's late quartets, Shakespeare's prose, and Rembrandt's portraits, for the first cup of coffee in the morning, and the iPod I've almost learned how to use, he says, for Morgan Freeman's voice and Woody Allen's humor, for 2B pencils and wide-lined notebooks, for bookshops and a forgiving wife. I thank God for the atheists and agnostics who keep believers from believing the unbelievable, forcing us to prove our faith by the beauty and grace we bring into the world. I thank God for the gift of faith which taught me to see the dazzling goodness and grace that surrounds us if we only open our eyes. And I thank God for helping me to understand that faith is not certainty, but rather the courage to live with uncertainty. Beautiful, isn't it? You can find this online. It, there's, there's more to it. It's wonderful. I find myself giving thanks to God for all the things that cost nothing and are worth everything. Executive coach Michael Balkin says that being grateful is like a magic pill that doesn't require a prescription, doesn't cost anything, has no negative side effects, and can help anybody. This morning, whether you think of gratitude as a magical pill or a spiritual practice, gratitude is essential to our faith and to living the lives that God wants us to live, lives of abundance and thanksgiving. What are you most grateful for? 